My name is Ali Mir Safasi. I teach at NYU. And um, I hope that you are all in good health and safe and have been in, 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 in good health. We are here to celebrate and discuss uh, Professor Mauna Kia's recent book, um, um, Persian Itself, Memories of Place and Origin Before Nationalism. Um, the, book, the, the book was published in 2020, earlier this year, by um, Stanford University Press. Um, I will not spend time discussing the book since we have two young scholars who will be in conversation with Professor Kia about the book. I also have to say that this, this event itself is a little unique because all three of our speakers are from Columbia University. Um, Professor Manakia is currently a, an associate professor at Department of Middle East, South Asia and African Studies at Columbia University. Um, she did her bachelor degree at Wasser and MA at NYU, so to, to be a little chauvinistic about NYU. Um, Mana is a scholar of early modern and modern social, cultural, and intellectual histories of West, Central, and South Asia. Um, apart from the current book, uh, um, um, Mana is working on her second book project, tentatively, as, as I have it here, titled Sensibilities of Belonging, beautiful title. I hope this becomes permanent uh, title. Um, this book studies a shared sense of aesthetic and ethical forms in the trans-regional circulation of people, text and ideas in 18th century um, India. Um, our two young scholars are both doctoral candidates at Columbia. Catherine Amber is a doctoral candidate at the Department of Middle East, South Asia, and African Studies at Columbia University. Catherine's research interests are in the area of pre-modern Persian literature, Islamic studies and Persian Central Asia. Um, her dissertation traces the ways in which 16th and 17th century um, Haskras, momentous or biographies in my, my own work, of Persian poets articulate social imaginaries through commemorations of poet, poetries, and plays. And finally, we have um, Andrew McLaurin, who is also a doctoral candidate at Columbia, but in a different department in religion studies department. Andrew works on pre-modern Islamic history with interest in Islamic ethics, theology, and written culture. Um, he specializes in Arabic and Persian historiography. Uh, thank you so much, Mana. I am delighted to, to have you here and to be able to host you and look forward to both your comments and the conversation. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Um, I, I want to um, thank uh, uh, the Iranian Studies Initiative at NYU and its director, Ali Mir Sepasi, and to Catherine um, and uh, Andrew McLaren for agreeing to participate in this conversation. Um, and to all of you uh, for will willing to spend more time on Zoom. <laughs> um, 
So I know this is an Iranian studies venue, but I'm not sure how commonly it may or may not be known that Persian was a dominant language of the Islamic East and used by not Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So roughly in the 14th and 19th century, um, Persian was the language of power and learning across Central, South, and West Asia, used for government, philosophy, Sufi literature, historical commemoration, storytelling, poetry, and ethical literature. And so as a result, um, a heavy and continuous circulation of people, texts, practices, and ideas connected Persian and Asia beyond the kinds of connections of the wider sort of um, Eurasian or Indian Ocean world. Um, so this mobility sustained a shared cultural hermeneutics across these regions that could be taken up by rulers to form imperial ideologies, utilized by merchants in everyday transactions, or invoked by mendicants in their peregrinations. Um, and the set of arguments that I basically make in this book is that Persianate sensibilities had to be acquired because one was never born with them. Persians were the, the kind of person who received a particular form of basic education that imparted the Persianate, through which they understood and engaged with the world. So Persian here, I'm using this as a, as a kind of, um, it's a textual corpus whose encapsulated meanings also lived and circulated orally in stories and in verse for broader audiences. Um, so um, I want to share my screen. Um, Uh, are you able to see it? Here, yeah. right. huh? Okay, so I'm, I'm showing you this just to give you a, set, a sense of the context. And um, as Catherine well knows and may notice, Central Asian um, qualities are left out of this map. Um, but nevertheless, um, even though my book is not the story of empires, I thought it would helpful to kind of uh, put this map up as a, a kind of way to visualize the political state of things circa 1700. So in light of the, the basic introduction I gave you, in general, the main question animating my work is what kinds of histories, meaning worlds, highs, and divisions do we see when we look beyond nationalist and regional frames to the thick and deep past connecting various parts of Asia together? Um, and I realized that speaking of connections, what is the risk of romanticizing a cosmopolitan pre-modern? But when I started this project, I was writing in the context of scholarship that assumed divisions. And knowing what was shared seemed essential to a truly historicized understanding of what was not. Um, so when I started this work, a lot of what I read, and remember this was a while ago, um, still evaluated the, the period before the rise of colonial modernity with categories, terms, and understanding belonging to this later period. And this is limiting to me because categories are important. And if you begin with too many assumptions, you generally find what you're looking for. Um, at the risk of obscuring everything else that doesn't fit and might change its meaning. Um, and I'm, I also was very much um, affected um, and influenced um, by the fact that, as Sheldon Pollock has pointed out, how can we know what colonialism and its forms of knowing changed if we don't know what was there before, right? Um, so we can't assume that colonial modernity was as much of a rupture as it claimed to be. Um, so the work I started doing was in part dedicated to clearing conceptual ground to even be able to speak about what I was interested in. Now, you've heard me use this word Persianate, and it's been used in a variety of ways, especially over the last couple of decades, uh, to describe the distinct political and cultural formations, as well as their intellectual and um, literary corpus that characterize Eastern Islamic domains. Um, and it, it's generally treated separately in Middle East studies and South Asian studies. Um, and the Persian age for me functions as um, a very kind of helpful intermediary scale of analysis somewhere between the regional and the global. Um, and I, it sort of overlaps with other for intermediate forms of analysis like Indian Ocean studies or land-based intra-Asian studies. Um, 
So the book itself, uh, Persian 8 Selves, presents an argument about what place and origin meant for Persians across Iran and India in the 18th century. And roughly, I look at the period between the fall of the Safavids in 1722 um, and when the British abolished official use of Persian in India in, uh, over the 19th, uh, over the 1830s. Um, specifically, I outline how the expansive and multiple notions of place and origin allowed for a range of possibilities of collective affiliation, out of which pre-modern Persianate cells grew. So in, in the book, I bring together works that are usually under separate genres, um, and I look at biographical compendiums, or tasketas, travelogues, histories, uh, memoirs and poetry, and I kind of um, put them together under the heading of commemorative texts based on their shared imperative of commemoration as well as other common forms and features. Um, the same overarching logic of diversity, of difference, legible as coherence, govern the range of possible conceptions of place and origin. Ultimately, what I argue is that multiple places and origins a diversity understood as proper and necessary constituted a range of Persianate collectives and their selves that crossed modern boundaries. Pre-nationalist Persians were from many lands, religions, occupations, social locations, and even genders, though these boundaries possess apparatic rather than categorical distinctions that require reassessment of their historical meanings. Um, so this is the table of contents. Um, and I'm just going to go quickly over the outline of the chapters. Um, so the central premise of uh, place, which is section one of the book, is that the overarching logic of empirical geography was but one possible mode of knowing place. Because it was embedded in and continuous with other modes of knowing place that were different and even undermined empiricism, we cannot view it as definitive. So the three chapters in this section address the significance of different scales of place, the possible modes of placemaking, and the way places were invested with meaning. So chapter one um, begins by outlining the flexibility and multivalence of terms and begins by distinguishing common ways of understanding um, units of geographical place, such as kingdoms and provinces, um, from effective notions of place, such as homelands. Um, and one of the kind of very important thing to remember here is that homelands were often very, very small places, um, cities or towns exclusively. Um, chapter two um, illustrates the role of commemorating near and far past and attributing meaning to 18th century presence. Um, marked by the fall of the Safavid Empire and the devolution of Timurid power for Persians in and between Iran and India. Uh, different interpretations of contemporary events remark um, events remarkably similar understandings of lands, geographies, and their relation to other places, all with reference to proper ethical forms in learning, service, uh, rulership, social interaction, and piety. So chapter three looks at the cartographic effects of meaning making and features of place that lent them a moral cast. Um, widely recognized features of urbanity, learning, just rule, and the storied tradition of Persian and Islamic narratives connected the universal with the local and the particular. Um, Transregionally circulating commemorations of place created a morally imbued sense of familiarity and proximity that was more significant than empirical geographical contiguity. So you could feel like you knew and um, feel a, a sense of affiliation with the place that um, was not next to the land you were from necessarily, right? Um, so other features of place could also create a gradient of familiarity with places within and beyond Persianate Islamic lands. Uh, so the three chapters in section two um, examine the meaning and labor of origins among Persians between Safavid Iran and Timurid India. I begin with a common uh, modern assumption that a homeland in the Safavid kingdom established a primordial proto-Iranian loyalty that marked all migrants to India, even those in Timurid imperial service. Um, and basically modern scholarship possesses limited conceptual means by which to understand origins outside of mutually exclusive categories taken to be definitive of affiliation. Usually place is given prominence along with religion, nationality, and ethnicity. 
As with place, though, I argue that modern categories are either not definitive or else entirely inappropriate. Um, chapter four argues that the form of origin was lineage multifariously um, constituted. So alongside territorialized notions of origin, they were often far more important lineages, including those of service, learning, aesthetics, and practice, which call into question our understanding of meaningful connection. Uh, the fifth chapter looks at pre-modern notions of social collectives, which are commonly called tribes or ethnicities. Um, and I dispense with these terms historicizing uh, social collectives through the adab um, or the form of their telling. Um, I find the connection between various line lineages of birth, of legal status, and other formal socially regulated uh, relationships. The variety of lineages constituting origin requires a, a reconsideration of kinship that dislodges law and birth as definitive. Um, a historicized reading of origins thus defies modern categories like nation, ethnicity, or tribe, and requires instead a reconsideration of kinship that dispenses with anachronistic notions of biological truth. Um, so the, in chapter six, um, I take the previous chapter's more expansive notion of kinship and consider the ways in which naming captured the possibilities of affiliation, and particularly I elaborate on the regionally specific ways in which Persians called themselves and each other, um, and how transregional circulation accommodated such specificities in the lineaments of the universal. So names of both individuals and collectives linked people to groups and each to each other in ways that were relational, contextual, and thus belie the discrete mutual exclusivity of modern categorization. Um, and finally, um, in the last chapter, I sort of bring everything together by um, thinking about the way changing political and economic factors in the 18th century challenged social connections and coll collective affiliation raising the stakes for commemoration for societies facing fracture and reconstitution in both Iran and India. Um, so this last chapter explicitly focuses on Tazkata writing in the aftermath of imperial devolution, um, focusing on the insight they offer into possibilities for articulating collectives and selves. Um, and specifically, I look at poetic Tazkata's, um, which commemorate aesthetically socially constituted collectives of Persians. Um, and these included past and contemporary poets as part of an imagined community of ancestors and peers um, in which were nested networks of social relationships. Um, and the sheer number and diversity of such texts enunciate the many possible ways these collectives could be imagined and themselves brought into being. Uh, this was a Persian who could be affiliated with a multiplicity of places and have diverse origins that little resembled those demanded by nationalism. Um, so the book made a claim for what it meant to be per Persian before nationalism. It also addresses itself to the violence and exclusions of modern nationalist politics, as well as the limits of its forms of knowing. Um, and ultimately, my contention is that we can't find our way out of the conundrums of the present by only looking within modern limits. Um, and so I wanted to look at an earlier time when ways of seeing and being in the world were different, not necessarily to return to them, uh, but as an inspiration for ways of imagining new futures. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that, um, and we can kind of talk more in the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mana. Very, very interesting. And um, there is already a number of, um, of uh, questions that I have uh, for you. Um, 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 I have to see folks, but the, the floor is yours now, Andrew and Catherine. Um, and, um, and we have about 40 minutes for um, for your conversation. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Professor Kia. And uh, I want to echo the thanks to the organizers and to you all for joining us. Um, Andrew and I have a number of questions. Some are more method methodological, I would say, um, focused on sort of how this project took shape. Um, and you addressed that a little bit in your opening comments. And then we have others that are more getting into the, the stuff of the book. Um, and I, I wanted to, you, you started to talk about these um, bringing different genres together that sometimes are treated separately as commemorative texts. And um, one thing I was really struck by when I first read this book was the dramatis personae that it begins with, that immediately uh, kind of got me uh, interested in these extraordinary sort of idiosyncratic, variegated, and sometimes it seemed extremely difficult lives that some of these um, figures led. And then obviously in the text, you're, you're digging into the meat of these commemorative works. And so with this in mind, I was wondering um, if you could talk more about maybe one source in particular that um, helped you to start articulating these questions earlier on in the project, um, or that was especially compelling to you, um, or that brought together a number of different um, you know, themes that you found really compelling to put in juxtaposition with each other. Um, um, so I, it would be hard to pick one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, I, I started, I, I moved very um, systematically backwards in time. Um, and uh, I had meant to actually look at a later period of time. And I had actually gone um, during my PhD um, research, I had gone and done a bunch of archival research, um, looking largely at the second half of the 19th and early 20th century, because I was interested in thinking about um, Iranians that had circulated in the Indian Ocean across South Asia and Southeast Asia. But I think one of the things that I found is that, um, A, I realized that this was part of a much longer standing circulation. It hadn't just started the, the, the colonization of British. And so I started reading travel logs. Um, and, you know, my research started at a very fortuitous time because so many of the sources that I used for the book had just started to be published. Um, at the time, you know, within the last 10 years that I began looking for them. Um, and it's not that other scholars hadn't looked at them before, but most of the um, sources that I use are very, very long. Um, and they're, you know, thousands of pages long. And the idea of sitting and reading them um, in, a, in a more or less systematic way was just, at, you know, in tiny crib, a uh, shikata, manuscripts, half of which were like, half of which were smudged or, or moth eaten. Um, you know, a, a number one, someone on my committee actually who had used them earlier had said, well, now you know why I only looked at, you know, one <laughs> entry across multiple uh, texts. But I was able to actually come upon um, these newly published sources, whether they were five, 600 page travel logs or 2,000 page task it is. And I was able to sit down and read them in a way that I think would have been much harder before they were published, um, especially given our time for de degrees, right? Um, and uh, one of the most kind of important texts that I started with was uh, Ahmad Behbahani's travel log um, in the early 19th century uh, from Iran. Um, I mean, he sort of travels through Iran. Uh, for a bit and then he goes to India and he travels around in, and spends time in various cities for about five years. Um, and he, right, he, he's actually in Bengal and he writes the uh, book and I don't know if you can really call it a travelogue. Um, it's more, he writes it as a um, uh, right? It's a Afal, right? It's kind of mirror of the world um, and it includes his family history, his travels, and also information about these different places that he picks up. And he writes it, um, and he leaves five copies in India, and then he takes it with him to Iran, and he dedicates it uh, to a Qajar print, right, because he's trying to get a job. Um, and he shows up, and that doesn't really amount to much, but the text is very interesting because he's a mujtahid, right? Um, and what I saw is that he did not, um, he did not in, he didn't represent and he's writing for an Iranian audience. It's very clear um, in the text when he's introducing um, specific terms and words. He picks Persian terms that it rhymes with to give his presumed Iranian audience some way of understanding how to read the words. Um, 
But one of the things that didn't fit for me that I found incongruous that he was nationalist. He uh, um, he cursed Shias and praised non-Muslims, um, and he did so. And I was sitting there trying to figure out what the logic of his identification or condemnation with different people and practices that he encountered was. And it clearly it wasn't religion, <laughs> right? It wasn't adherence to Islamic law. It wasn't being Iranian. Um, so it, it was, and it wasn't even being part of his family um, because he had extended cousins in Murshidabad. Um, so it, it, was a, it was the first kind of um, signal to me that something was up uh, that I couldn't understand about this text um, with the kind of, um, th through the analytic lenses that we had at our disposal. Um, and so that was one very kind of formative moment um, and encounter with the source. Following on from the um, previous question, um, we wanted to ask about any theoretical works that were particularly important. Um, one of the concepts you reference is um, Derrida's understanding of aporia. And I know that that's, um, you talk a bit about that in the book, um, but I was wondering if uh, beyond that, or um, there's anything that sort of, um, particularly structured your thinking about belonging in this context? Um, I mean, it's it's hard. There's a number of, I, I also referenced Judith Butler. Um, and and it's, it's a little bit hard because I don't fully develop some of these ideas in this book um, because when I, um, I had to split the manuscript, which was a painful and horrible process, um, but one of the things that I do when I work is that, I mean, I, I tend to read a number of different things, um, but I work as closely as possible from my sources. And I feel like my engagement with theory works very helpfully to kind of train my reading and thinking. Um, and yes, um, with Derrida, how I came to him is that I arrived at this issue of um, a sort of logic um, of distinctions in Adab, which were not these hard and fast distinctions. That you were able to see people making distinctions um, of difference, but they didn't function in the same way. And I didn't know how to discuss it. Um, and I came up with this idea that, well, it's not Iranian or Indian. It's not either or, right? And, and you didn't need these um, now you can only talk about, you can only combine these things that are very different with a hyphen. <laughs> um, and it was really, it was really some kind of going and speaking with people and going back and reading certain texts um, that I realized actually, you know, Aporia can actually help me talk about this thing that I see. Um, and actually in the next book, um, I engage with, I bring Saadi together with Derrida because you can see this sensibility very much through Sadi's Golestan, for instance. Um, and the other kinds of theoretical, I mean, the other big theoretical influence on me in general has been uh, feminist theory um, and historiography. And um, I would say that Judith Butler's work on gender has been very, very important for me, um, specifically because it's about the constitution of um, a, a self, and a particular identity. Um, and it, identity is also a word that I try very hard to avoid, uh, partly because I feel that this is an anachronistic thing to search for in a pre-modern context. Um, because, you know, if we are to accept various um, things that we have read about, for instance, in Foucault's work about how modern identity functions in creating the truth of a person, um, through a very specific set of um, technologies, forms of knowing, disciplines, um, then um, how, how, why does it exist everywhere? Um, I also um, read and thought with Talal Asad and Gil Anajar's work. Um, and Gil Anajar's book in particular was very important for me. Um, when I read it, I realized, wow, you know, I had already written the stuff on origin and I had um, originally had a distinction between uh, consanguineous and non-consanguineous um, uh, kinship. And then I read his book and I 
And I went back and I looked at my sources and I thought, oh my God, there's no blood in Persian. People do not talk about relationships um, using blood. Um, and, and I had just unthinkingly imposed it from English. Um, and you know that's different now necessarily in modern Persian, but in pre-modern Persian, it is not there. The only time they talk about blood is murder <laughs> or, or, or war or something like this. Um, and so that was also very important in thinking about um, the way in which it's very easy to impose our own meanings on tasks and how productive it can be to give a kind of um, bit of space in a moment of pause um, to think about how sources are producing meaning themselves. Uh, but at the same time, to um, have a, a, a way in which um, engaging and reading and thinking um, theoretically can sharpen um, our, our kind of ability and approach and sensitivity towards reading. In your, um, in your opening remarks, you were talking about how there are multiple different kinds of people who are, you know, who have a sense of belonging within the Persian net, right? From many lands, religions, social locations, and even genders. And I wanted to ask a bit about gender. Um, you know, you describe in this context morality being, uh, you describe masculinity as morality, femininity as its lack, with this exception of effet or chastity as a, as a feminine virtue. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak more about kind of this gendering of morality on the one hand, but then also ways in which women uh, could and did contest this dominant view um, and actually, you know, be a, a part of, of the Persianate. Um. So, I mean, one of the things that I tried very hard to show um, is that, you know, it, it, it wasn't, um, this is not a, this is not a sort of cultural and um, social sphere that is um, prizes um, equality, right? Um, so this is a hierarchical environment, um, and gender was, you know, one one axis of hierarchy, um, as were things like social location, right? Um, and um, but one of the things that I found is that this language of morality. Um, and morality as um, embodied in adab uh, was, was very much determinative in a way that things like religion, um, uh, gender, social location, these things were not in the end determinative by themselves, right? And you can see these in prescriptive texts as well as in um, kind of texts that um, are narrating um, people and places that are contemporary to a time, right? Um, and in the case of women, uh, one of the things that I, um, one of the things that I generally tended to see is that men talked about women in a particular way. Um, and that was not necessarily how they talked about themselves. And, and this is an important kind of um, thing to put alongside each other. You could extend this kind of uh, difference to non-Muslims, um, to others who fell outside of the idealized center, um, right? The presumed normative subject of Adab was most definitely male, was Muslim, um, and had some kind of, you know, what we would call now Middle Eastern origin, right? Came from these kind of um, Islamic heartlands, right? Um, and, and at their very center, you know, it was like a Sayed or something. Um, or from another kind of lineage that was very, very uh, prominent. And, you know, that could be a Turco-Mongol lineage. Um, and, but at the same time, um, you had uh, women that would basically use the language of adab to push back on uh, the superiority of male gender, right? Because you had a language of morality that was actually gendered, like Mardan Nagi. Um, was a sort of, you know, way of talking about being morally superior. <laughs> um, but you, then you had women that were marked as acting with mad donagi, right? Um, and this is the honorary, uh, this is the honorary male uh, method of including women. And women themselves used it differently, right? They're, they push their inclusion in by basically um, making different kinds of claims, which is that, 
Um, and I use La Le Khatun uh, or Padsha Khatun uh, as an example. Um, and she's a um, sort of late 13th century ruler whose work and story continues to be commemorated into the 18th uh, century um, in, in India, in Iran, um, and her poetry, which articulates something very differently than just she was like Alexander or that she um, ruled in a manly way, <laughs> right? And she basically talked about how the fact that she could keep her self invalid under her hijab um, qualified her to keep the city of Kerman impenetrable, right? So, I mean, this is a very interesting connection um, where her, um, her specific um, gendered uh, being in the world is being used to um, underwrite and justify and legitimize and, and, and law the nature of her rule. So <clears throat> in the sense that um, um, men were sort of defining themselves against women, women found ways to um, then turn that around. Um, what were some of the key components of the sort of the adab of the Persianate that you're um, addressing here? Like what are the sort of, um, maybe you could say technologies of the self that people are using positively to shape their um, belonging, sort of express um, not just where they're from, but like who they are as they continue to be from multiple places. Um, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're asking, but I, I think one of the things that's very important is that this is relational, right? Um, and so it really depended on who you are um, and whether you could um, sort of convincingly inhabit um, the, the sort of uh, norms and ideals of adab that were appropriate to your situation and station. Um, whether it was your actual situation and station or sometimes it was aspirational, right? Um, and it could, actual, it could actualize um, that aspiration to do it convincingly. Um, so one of the things I try and look at um, and show is uh, people uh, in particular um, may have been able to, to put themselves forward according to the company they kept, right? Um, and I, I think, and, and again, this is something I'll get into in future work a little bit more. A lot of what I had to pull out of this manuscript and put aside, I was only able to hint at. Um, but one of, the, one of the kind of biggest points that I try and make is that Adab is, um, the, the form, the ethical and aesthetic form of both uh, sort of perceiving the world, but also being in the world. And depending on who you were, and this could include, for instance, um, an occupational category, right? Say you were a munshi or a scribe, um, say you were a merchant, um, there were particular virtues that it was incumbent on, upon you to embody. Um, and you needed to, for instance, if you uh, made a lot of money, you needed to give very generously in particular ways to show uh, that you were not uh, a miser, um, that you know generosity could offset a whole bunch of things. But generosity looked different when a merchant practiced it than when a military person practiced it than when a Sufi practiced it, right? Um, and I think that was it. But one of the things that I see very often is uh, people um, pointing to the ways in which they practice um, the, the um, proper behaviors towards different people in the world. Uh, they're proper to who they were and uh, were proper vis-a-vis -vis who they were dealing with. Um, so, I mean, one, one kind of big arena um, of kind of being a successful self <laughs> was um, a, a proper kind of uh, enactment of social form toward a collective, right? Uh, towards the people around you. And you can see this um, everywhere from the prescriptive texts of Persian akhlaq, right? Um, you can think about akhlaq uh, uh, right? Where uh, uh, you have this idea that there are different ways that one must behave with everybody else. Um, and that this is what allows a society to cohere, right? 
Um, and this kind of social success, uh, both in behaving in proper ways with other people, but also balancing out the relative demands between them um, is, is pretty much what um, generated the grist for, for, being, um, for being able to show yourself as a possessor of adab, right? Now, I have to admit that's not something I really get into in this book, um, but one of the things I try and show is that um, people position themselves um, in terms of their origin and their social status um, in, in the context of who they were. And they created affiliations with various kinds of people based on these things. Um, so you, you could have uh, multiple affiliations, people across religious boundaries, for instance. Uh, and, and those connections were made based on the um, uh, claiming of uh, proper adab and the maintenance of social relationships in particular. I find it this this idea of adab as ways of perceiving and being in the world is is really helpful and compelling to me. And I was thinking as well about you know aesthetics um, and ethics and the way you're kind of describing them as being on a continuum um, in adab, if I, if I if I understand correctly. Um, and and one question that I had that was just occurring to me um, as you were speaking was thinking about tazkiras that I'm familiar with in a slightly earlier context where the sort of social virtues are very masculine, but then when um, someone is describing a poet's thoughts and their poetic meanings, very often the language of virtue that's used for that domain is, is feminine, right? And they're pardenishin, um, they're, they're behind a hijab, um, they're, you know, resisting tasarof, resisting kind of the assault of the sharp speak, uh, the, you know, the sharp uh, reader. Um, and I was, I was wondering if that's something that you see as well in, in this later period, if this, this idea kind of continues, um, and if that kind of plays into this idea of sort of multiplicity um, in a kind of relational way of, of dealing with things like, like gender. Um, I mean, I think, that, I think it's important to point out that certain things like um, chastity and restraint, right? Um, the, these, these, I think the difference with the modern context is that these aren't limited to women, right? These are virtues for everybody. Men are also praised for having restraint and chastity. And, you know, a lot of them talk about, I never ever opened the string of my, the drawer of my pants, right? <laughs> it's a common term. Um, but I think only later it becomes defining of women. Um, I don't think it's exclusive to women, but I think it's one of the few virtues that women also can have. Um, women don't have bravery. Um, I mean, you know, generosity, it's, it's these things that are so heavily associated with masculinity. Um, but I, so I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I also think that um, something like, um, Padanishini, right? Um, sort of sitting behind a curtain, literally, but it, it really means a kind of separation from society, right? It, it means um, pulling oneself away. Now, part of the problem is this is actually a set of meanings that doesn't really have anything to do with gender in a certain sense, right? It's about um, uh, the, the set of uh, hierarchies of meaning, to use the words of Shehab Ahmad, right, to do with um, uh, being uh, part of a deeper or a superficial or a more superficial truth, right? And the idea is that politics is a dirty, dirty uh, world, um, and it's part of the um, people of the world that, you know, only see politics for the sake of power, whereas those who um, either participate or choose not to, um, because it's impossible to remain, um, you know, ethically kind of preserve the pull away, pad the nishini as part of that act, right? Um, so, I mean, I think that that has a lot less, in the modern period, the idea of pad de has become an exclusively, something exclusively associated with women. But I actually think that's a that's a later idea, right? And that's part of a whole host of images surrounding the Oriental despot and the corrupt uh, Oriental, right? And it's a, a set of um, representations of uh, 
kind of political power and manliness um, that I think belong to another realm of meaning. So in this regard, given that there's this um, conflict, not necessarily over the precise terms, but about the sort of um, system of meaning holding those terms, you talk a little bit in the book about how um, possessing a language meant something different in this earlier period, right? In the context of nationalism, possessing a language is a claim about origin, about nativity, right? About being born into a language. But this is very much not the case for some of the thinkers that you um, worked with, whether because they were, say, born into a bilingual environment or because they acquired other languages later. Um, so what exactly did it mean to possess a language in the time that you covered? Um, well, again, you guys are asking great questions. And these are things that I um, try and think about a little bit more in the next book. Um, I mean, I'm really, I'm really, um, I'm really taking off from Sheldon Pollock's discussions um, about how there is no such thing as a native language in a pre-modern context, right? And we really actually need to think uh, what nativeness means. And this is something that I very much take under um, attack, right? By using these terms like native and foreigner and um, as if they meant the same thing then that they do now. And it, the, the realm of what is native, right? Which is, uh, comes from nativity, which is a place of birth, a birthplace. Um, what is the size of birthplace, right? What is the homeland? Is there only one? Um, and, you know, if people identified a homeland as that little village that's 10 miles outside of Esfahan, right? Um, you know, they're a native of where exactly? And, and why do we assume it's the land of Iran, which then can be made to exist from time immemorial, right? And that even if it has existed in certain points of um, discussion, why do we assume it has always meant the same thing? Um, so, I mean, this is, this is something I really wanted to think about because it was very clear to me, um, the more that I read, and there's more scholarship being written about this now, um, many, many people were multilingual, right? Whether in Iran or in India, whether they were illiterate or not, right? Um, one of the things we, we uh, like to remember, one of the things that's very important to remember is that even in the 20th century, it was something like 60% after all of Pahlavi efforts, right? It's 60% of people spoke Persian as first language in Iran. Um, and the fact is it, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was only a massive point of anxiety in the 20th century uh, that this was the case. Um, and in fact, under the Safavids, uh, Turkish was a very important language. It was the language of the court, spoken language of the court. It was a language of the military. Um, and it was so kind of prestigious that it was cultivated in and around Esfahan as a high status vernacular, right? Um, and so it, it, this idea that was also something I wanted to challenge is that Persian was the language of Iran. And then it circulated to these other places um, like Central Asia and India, where they spoke Turkish and Hindi, right? And and that's that that just needed to be mixed up um, and disturbed enough, because many people spoke many different languages and could have different kinds of relationships uh, to those languages. Um, and I think that it's much easier to think about the contextual life of them. Um, we also know, for instance, that for um, several centuries in certain places like Kashmir, um, Persian was a spoken language as well, right? Um, it wasn't just um, a language that circulated orally maybe as poetry or stories um, or a learned language um, or a language, you know, I mean, in Timurid ruled um, India, also called Mughal India, which I don't call it for a very particular reason, um, uh, Everyone, like, you know, Persian became the language of administration down to the level of the village tax collector. The village headman had to be able to read and write Persian. Um, so, I mean, these are, these are things to kind of remember and think about. Um, in, we can speak about first languages, we can speak about subsequent languages, we can speak about, we can think about what it might have meant in a polylingual or a multilingual environment. Um, and this is also one of the things that gives Persian a different life in particular localities is those interactions 
um, and variations. But people in a particular locality also could have very different kind of multilingual experience. Um, and something I tried to talk about when I was looking at how Abu Talib is traveling from Istanbul um, back to Bengal um, and passing through various regions um, in Anatolia. And he starts to notice that, well, this is what the elites speak. And this is at which, at, this is at the city is, this city is the point at which the common people start to speak Persian, right? Um, and so, I mean, he, he does make those differences and tracks them. Since you mentioned the uh, the dirty world of politics earlier, <laughs> I wanted to ask a little bit about that and just uh, you know the the choice of the period that you're focused on, which seems to me to be marked by these experiences of losses in both Iran and Hindustan. Um, for instance, you're describing these kind of transregionally shared understandings of Iran after the fall of the Safavids in 1722 as being in ruins um, and disorder in Hindustan under the Timurids, um, especially in the perspectives of authors who are kind of tied to imperial capitals and are maybe viewing things with an emphasis on, on that. Um, so I'm wondering if, if these experiences of loss are important in how you came to focus on this period. Um, and since you're focusing on commemorative texts, um, how experiences of loss uh, affect the memories of place and origin with which you're engaged. I mean, I picked this period because it's it's not very sexy in terms of um, uh, political, uh, um, you know, there's no great Shah Abbas, there's no Akbar or Shah Jahan, right? Um, empires are kind of crumbling. Um, and there's been a little bit more kind of interesting things done in the context of South Asian studies for um, looking at this period where uh, one set of empire ends, and then by the end of the um, century, a very different kind of political order is put into place that, that has a very different trajectory. Um, and this happens in both Iran and India. Um, it's been a little bit more subtly fleshed out in the context of South Asian studies, but I mean, as, most of the time, um, the 18th century in um, Iranian scholarship is still kind of a story of great men and great events right? Nadir Shah, the sword of Persia. Um, you know, you're looking for some kind of high military history. Now, it's helpful to know those things, um, but, you know, you, you read these um, accounts of the collapse of the Safavids, the subsequent invasions, um, and, you know, people like Nadir Shah or Karim Khan Zan, um, and the question becomes, well, what did it all mean? What did it mean for people that were living there, um, what was the experience of those things? Like once we know that those things happened, the question for me became, how did people experience it? What did it mean for them? What did it mean for their cultural world, their social, like what was possible, um, their, their, their actual circulation? Um, because this is also the period of time that is generally understood to be the moment the much kind of broader transregional Persianate world fractures, and, you know, eventually by the end of the 18th century, fractures beyond repair. Um, and so I, I wanted to have some sense of how to put together, uh, you know, political collapse um, and, and massive upheaval with um, what we kind of know ends up happening, which is that um, Persian as a transregional language uh, kind of is gone by the, by the end of the 18th century. So <clears throat> um, we already got one question in the chat um, from Professor Keshav Arzian, but before we go to that, I wanna ask, um, you sort of closed the book on this um, note of imagining other possibilities, right? You say we gain sort of valuable resources for thinking about ourselves um, in um, what sometimes seems like an impoverished present. So I wanted to ask you, what are those resources? What, I mean, what sort of things have you um, imagined, if I can ask, um, you know, in the wake of completing this project and what sort of resources have you gotten? Um, well, the, the idea is that this was, this book was really um, meant to be in some ways a conceptual clearing ground 
Um, and I wanted to offer a different way to imagine what it meant to be Persian um, and what it meant to um, and how people that were these kinds of Persians imagined places um, and their relationships to them and their origins and their relationships to people. Um, and I think for me, the main, and, and the question is, this is, this is also meant to be a kind of opening um, for more of a discussion. It's not meant to be like a definitive last word, right? Um, and for me, it seems like I wanted to know that there were so many questions I had reading the scholarship that existed. First of all, we were told um, that the early modern period is the first kind of moment of actual globalization, right? Where you start to have this massive movement and circulation of people on a previously untold scale. And people were living together and communing with each other in different ways. And yet for a lot of places, we're told Iran became this place under the Safavids that was that became completely intolerantly Shia, right? Um, and, and, and a very easy line gets drawn, you know, and then there's this kind of intolerant Shiism lives and, and defines Iran. Um, sort of over a long period of time. Um, and India gets read through the lens of um, communalism, right? It's just Muslims and Hindus at each other's throats. That is the determinative factor. Now, obviously there's a lot of scholarship that is complicating these ideas, but I wanted to look at, and this is the, the sort of intervention I try to make. Um, I wanted to look at what it meant um, to kind of relate to one another. And I wanted to reevaluate what these kinds of differences meant and what it meant um, and how people related to one another. You know, what were the bases? And some of the options that we have in South Asian studies um, is very much the attempt to make Persian and Persian culture secular. Um, and I also didn't want to go there because I think that's ridiculous. Um, and I think it's ridiculous because I think that um, that kind of marking of Persian as secular presumes something where religion um, re religion becomes something that um, functions a, in a certain way, right? Where religion actually becomes determinative. And so in order to have something secular, you have to evacuate religion out of it. Um, so I, I wanted to look at the way in which for many, many Persians, um, being a uh, Muslim meant being a good Persian, right? But there were also times where uh, certain aspects, uh, certain aspects uh, were prioritized above others, um, according to Adab, for instance, right? Um, and I also wanted to think about how so many non-Muslims participated, right, without considering themselves Muslims and maybe even being hostile to Islam. Um, and so I wanted to think about how that might work. And the aporia thing was very helpful, which is that um, Persian and, it, you know, Islam was understood to be the highest and best articulation of adab, right? But adab was also more than an exceeded Islam um, and that adab could exist in other places um, and sort of be, um, represented and embodied by others as well and other kinds of practices. Um, and that was very readily and easily recognizable to people whose uh, text that I was looking at uh, as a sensibility. Um, so you have Ad de Behbani, who's obviously very invested as a mujtahid in Islam um, and is very proud of whenever he gets to go somewhere and apply Islamic law. Uh, and yet, um, he praises the Hindu student that he has in Lucknow uh, for coming to see him after he's um, suffered a robbery. Um, and he, uh, at another point, condemns uh, an Iranian Shia uh, for um, being in the service of Tipu Sultan, who's um, not Shia, <laughs> but who he had sworn loyalty to, but uh, betraying him. And he basically says he's damned and going to hell, right? Um, Islam is not going to help us with that, right? 
Um, but actually, ADAB helps us with that. It helps us understand what's going on there. Um, and so for me, the resource, the main resource I got was um, getting access to a kind of different way of being in the world beyond um, these kind of modern categorizations of identity politics, which in some helpful ways function as the basis of rights, but also come up against um, numerous limits um, in terms of ways of knowing, right? Um, just as nationalism in many, many context has been a very emancipatory project, um, politically uh, and socially, it has also had incredibly um, grim and horrible limitations for people that cannot fit into its uh, strictures. And this way of um, apparatically being able to exist in multiplicity um, seemed to me to have a kind of potential um, for um, living together um, in a way that seemed worth paying attention to. You know, I had a, I had a couple more questions, but it seemed to me that um, Professor Keshavarzian's question might be uh, useful to address at this point. It seems connected to what you're, you're discussing. Um, I don't know if we want to open the floor now since we have limited time left. Uh, sure, thank you. It makes sense to to ask it rather than doing it by the chat. Um, thank you very much for a great uh, talk, very rich material, and I look forward to uh, reading your, your, your book. Congratulations on this publication. Um, I think I'm gonna ask something that maybe, you're, you're, you know, it's kind of an obvious question in some ways. Um, you know, you're offering us this very rich, decentered way to think about Persian and think about Persian outside of the Iranian frame, let's, let's say, outside of the, uh, um, nationalist uh, contours and the, the very bounded nature, kind of box-like understanding of, of Iran. But I'm wondering if, um, if you know, what that actually does for understanding Iranianness, right? So you're, if your project is trying to uh, helps us to think about Persian, Persianness in, in new ways or the Persian world in new ways, which I, it absolutely does. I'm just wondering if we can push you a little bit to use that, um, that, that, that rich research you've been doing for many years to also now speak to the question of Iranianness. And specifically, I was wondering if, um, if, 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 if uh, Persianness is so tied to language and language is so, uh, if you want, mobile, so uh, for lack of a better term, transnational uh, and so forth, um, does, are you suggesting that we should really think of Iranianness in, in more uh, cartographical ways in terms of land and geography and, and space uh, abstract as well as kind of lived place? Uh, and specifically, it, it, it sounds like to me, uh, I mean, you know, sounds like to me that you could have an interesting conversation with people such as Firuza Kajani Sabet who uh, is clearly working in uh, thinking about Iranian nationalism in terms of land and cartography, of course, in a much later period than you are in 19th century. But I was just wondering if you had thoughts about thinking about Persian or Persianness and Iranianness um, uh, together in, in um, not necessarily uh, opposite or mutually exclusive ways, but maybe in very complex overlapping ways and, and maybe how we can think of language and, and land uh, and together. I mean, um, so thanks for your question. Um, I, in the, I mean, I kind of started and I opened the book this way, um, talking about how when I was growing up uh, in Los Angeles, uh, people would ask me where I was from. Um, and, you know, you, you had to kind of pick, are you Iranian or are you Persian? And, you know, this was very politically fraught um, in the 80s. Um, and, you know, I was, always taught, no, no, you should say Persian because Iran is this place that they all see on the news and there's ayatollahs and black chadors and we don't wanna be associated with that. Um, and there was, it wasn't really even just revulsion, it was fear. Um, and th there was a lot of fear. Uh, and I just decided at some point when I was an older teenager that I was gonna tell people I was from Iran and they are gonna have to deal with how that made them uncomfortable. Um, and it, it, the thing that was, kind of surprising to me when I started doing this research is that Iran as a term existed um, obviously before nationalism, but I just couldn't sort the fact that 
um, there is still a, a way in which a kind of always existing Iran and so much of the modern scholarship still posited um, as transhistorical, even though that same scholarship may be making claims for the way in which Iran as a national concept becomes constructed, right? And so there wasn't actually a way to understand how it functioned before. <laughs> um, and when, when there was an attempt to um, posit a kind of pre-modern um, as, a, as a kind of opening framing story of, of uh, uh, you know, scholarship on the becoming of Iran, Iranian nationalism. Um, one of the things that happened is that some flat notion of the pre-modern got used. Um, you know, maybe they used Ghazvini's geographic text from the 13th century. That's, an, that's fine. That's an Ilhanid tech, you know, like, um, but it, it's not like a stack pre-modern, right? Um, there's a lot of things that happen in between the 13th and the 19th century. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do was to really kind of look um, at the mid and late 18th century and to say, you know, and, and I looked, I look at some earlier stuff too. And one of the things that I found is that Iran exists, um, but it's a very kind of flexible term. And actually most of the time before the fall of the Safavids, um, uh, when you say so-and-so went uh, to the domain of the Safavids, what, when you want to say they went to this place we call Iran that's ruled by the Safavids, they say so-and-so went to e e uh, either Iran and Arach or Khorasan and Arach. And what they mean, and Iran is interchangeable very often with Khorasan, um, and when they mean Arach, they mean Arach Ajan. And they this, these two, this pair, very often acts like a synecdoche for Safavid domains. Um, and as a term, Iran doesn't get used unless it's being talked about in the context of Rum, Turan, Hind, Iran, right? It's like we're talking about big geographic entities, but much more prominent were its, its provinces, right? The, and, and those are called uh, Mamlekets, right? And there's Mamalek and Mam Mamlekat, and this is this is one of the things I talk about. And in the um, in the coda, in the conclusion of the book, uh, one of the epigraphs that I put in is um, something someone said to me in 2008 when I was there doing my dissertation research. Um, I, you know, was reading all of these texts, and um, and then I went on a trip to Yaz, and my my dad was taking me through the bazaar and he has family connections there. And he introduced me to this very old man that was sitting in front of a jewelry shop um, and you know, introduced me as his daughter. And the man said, uh, you know, welcome to the country of Yaz. And I thought, oh my God, it's still, it's still there, right? You know, and, and you read scholarship and you know, all of this, you know, Kashani Sabet, Muhammad Tavakoli, like there's so many very important foundational scholars. Um, but, you know, Tavakoli has an argument about how, you know, Iran as a plurality of Mamlekats turns into a singular, but actually they're both existent in the 18th century and it's only about context. Um, and so for me, like this making this, first it was like this and then it was like this, it, it didn't really work. And then when I went to Yazd and I was like, oh, it's, it's still actually intelligible to turn around and say this to somebody, you know, and I had just finished telling him that I had come from Tehran um, and he called Yazd the Mamlekat. And I thought, wow, so it's still there. Our, our overarching logic is nationalism, but everything I'm describing is not completely dead and gone. And so there's still some temporal aporia. <laughs> Great. We, we have some time for anyone who has any questions. Yes, may I? Please. Unless there are others before me. Yes, okay. thank you so much for that very thoughtful presentation. I also look forward to reading your book and the future book as well. I have a twofold question. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, usually cultural influences are two-way streets. What were the mutual influences coming from India and the Ottomans, Indian Empire and the Ottoman Empire? to the Persian at world and how that molded the Persian at world. That's number one. What explains the decline of the appeal of Persian 
language, literature, culture in that larger domain that you just gave us a very wonderful purview of? Um, well, thank you for your question. Um, the the first the first um, the first part of it, I would say that um, the Ottoman Empire and the um, and India were part of the Persianate world, um, and so there is a way in which um, there is a very very rich circulation of people, texts, um, practices, and ideas going back and forth between these regions. I think one of the things that we still have to learn is the extent and the nature of that circulation. Um, I mean, I think some of it is being done, but there's still a very great deal that we don't know. The other thing that I think is important is that this circulation that we know existed between these regions, um, and it existed not just um, with the, the kinds of high elites that we think about, um, objects, goods circulated, craftsmen circulated, um, one of the things we've looked at, um, we have some information about, for instance, is artistic and papermaking techniques circulating um, specifically between Shiraz and the Deccan um, in India. Um, and th the fact is, is that stories went back and forth. Um, and we can think about the fact, let me give you an example. Um, so one of the things that I talk about um, is that uh, the pre-Islamic Persian uh, becomes a way for non-Muslims to participate um, in Persianate culture. And so one of the things you see is that in Western India, uh, a very prominent ruling family um, in, uh, of the Marathas um, ends up claiming descent from Anushiravan, right? And so this authorized, this, this kind of lineage of descent authorizes their um, holding power. Um, and so this is a way that that happens, but there is also a way in which um, Persian culture affects our um, um, India and, and sort of things that are associated with Hindustan affect Iran. Um, in the 17th century, there are a number of poets in Iran um, who have the Tachalus Brahmin. And these are all, um, the, the two that I'm thinking of are both descended uh, from Georgian slaves. Um, and so they take the Tachalos Brahmin, um, which in Iran referred to someone who is not um, Muslim, but of high status, um, because they sort of understood something about these, these statuses because of the way in which the circulation brought a sense of familiarity with the people's places, practices, and ideas that may not have been part of their daily lives necessarily. Um, and I'm trying to think of your, can you repeat your second question? Yes. Uh, what are some of the political factors that are obvious, right? Decline of the Persian network that had to do with political uh -huh. decline. But what are some of the, was Persian culture exhausting itself? Is appeal to uh, reinvent itself and become dynamic so it's broadly appealing? Was that is stagnating as well? What, um, what explains the decline? I mean, that's the that's one of the dominant narratives, um, and that's a result of tendency to link um, culture far too closely to politics, right? So if we don't have a glorious king, then culture uh, declines. But that's actually not what a lot of people have been finding. Um, so a couple of things happens. Uh, one of the kind of main things is that you do have in the 18th century a period of uh, decentralization politically as well as great upheaval. Now, it's experienced much more traumatically in Iran than it is in some places like India where you start to have the development of regional kingdoms. But these patterns of political centralization and decentralization, um, we saw the same thing happen in the 15th century, for instance, when Timurid rule collapsed and devolved to, to very kind of small uh, kingdoms. Really, I mean, one of the kind of main changes that happens is um, after about two and a half centuries of Europeans um, being on the fringes of the Indian Ocean world, they start to directly colonize. Um, and under you know, the, the early British empire in India uh, uses Persian as a language of administration. And then eventually, um, it, you know, this starts to 
they start to move away from this as you know colonial rule kind of develops in particular ways. Um, and by the 1830s, they stop using um, Persian at all levels of government. Um, I think that's a very particular and important factor in the sort of um, uh, decline of Persian um, in India, in particular in the relationship with Iran. Um, and that happens right at the time in which Iran is starting to kind of reconstitute itself under Rajar, early Rajar rule. Um, so, I mean, you, you still have connections. Um, and I think that some of the things that scholars are starting to understand is the importance of, um, you know, inter-Asian connections in, you know, some of the things that we've learned a lot about in Iranian history, like discussions about reform um, that happened across the 19th century. They're still happening between Iran and India. They're just not happening in Persian for the most part anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, unfortunately, we, we need to stop in a few minutes. Um, we have uh, Leila, John, do you want to ask your question? And um, uh, this is a very rich and uh, fascinating discussion. I hope we had more time, but our speakers need to leave. Um, hopefully, we can do another program and come and follow up the conversation. Leila, do you want to ask your question? And sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Very interested in your book. I'm excited to read it. Um, and this might be beyond the scope. Maybe my question is, is this within the scope of your book or not? Um, I was interested in your uh, kind of conception of ki uh, kinship without ethnicity. And I'm wondering if, or do you th think through or talk through the notion of family or household in relation to kinship? So more kind of getting into the more micro relations of proximity and intimacy, like do those configure into how you think about identity formation in relation to the Persian itself? That seems to me that's related to kinship, but maybe it's too narrow for what you're doing in this project. Um, no, I, I did try and think through and with those ideas very much. Um, I mean, I went back and I had to read a lot of really new stuff to me on ethnicity. Um, you know, and I even went back and looked at um, Greek, ancient Greek writing, um, ancient Greek um, scholarship on ancient Greek, uh, because that's where um, eth the origin of the word ethnicity comes from, ethnos. Um, but, you know, ethnos is kind of like taifis, right? It, it, it can, it, it's not um, a tribe, right? It's like any group of people. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's kind of, um, it's projected backwards. And I started looking in sociological literature on how it's used. And it always produced, it, it depends on some kind of um, actual or fictive um, kinship tie. And this was always reduced to uh, biological kinship. kinship. Um, and so one of the things that I looked at were um, older definitions. I went into Quranic definitions um, and, you know, the, the words that are used, for instance, in, in Arabic and Islamic context, they can mean um, a family, um, as well as anyone in the household or who is, lives in intimate proximity, right? And so that opens up the discussion uh, much more, right? Um, and thinking about various kinds of ways. And then I looked at, you know, the Islamic concept of how babies are made. Um, and nobody shares blood. The only thing in the Islamic conception of babies um, is that you, you get um, all of the hard parts of your body from your father <laughs> and you get all the soft squishy parts from your mother. And so the only person that you share blood with is your mother and that's not Nessa, right? That's not pa patrilineal descent, right? And it just, everything I came up with showed me that trying to transpose um, ethnicity onto a certain understanding of biological descent, which is also a kind of sanitized, not very sanitized version of race, um, just didn't work, <laughs> right? And ethnicity is kind of like uh, biological descent with let's throw some culture in, right? Um, and these things, uh, it's meant to be kind of more user-friendly because it's purportedly more flexible, um, but the, the descent part, um, it was either real or it was fictive. 
but this still to me seemed to uh, evince a particular understanding of real biological descent, which I just don't think that you can um, uncritically superimpose to decide who is actually related to whom um, in a pre-modern context without trying to retrieve the different ways that people understood these kinds of relationships. Thank you so much. This was, was great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, um, Catherine and Andrew, for your very, very thoughtful questions. Um, you guys are so lucky to be uh, in one campus, and I'm sure that every week you have conversations like this. But thank you so much for <laughs> sharing your thoughts and, and, and uh, with us.